Hi guys, JLA Shorts has now arrived. The best bits of the JLA channel in nugget form. Be a legend and subscribe to the channel by checking the link in the description. Cheers. Hello friends, welcome back to the James Lawrence Allcott channel. It's time for some Champions League predictions. Yes, yes, yes. Time to get excited because football means something. I know it always means something, but now it really means something with teams leaving competitions. Exciting times. And I'm going to be doing reactions to all the big games. So make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell as well. We're going to break this into two parts, guys, because loads of games this week, of course, four games. And then next week, four huge games as well. So I thought the best thing to do is to give everyone their time and not make some juggernaut of a video. So we're going to kick off with PSG, Real Madrid. You've got Sporting versus Man City, Inter Milan versus Liverpool, and RB Salzburg versus Bayern Munich. Make sure you get involved in the comments, get your predictions down below. And as I said, subscribe so you don't miss out the second part of this if you're a fan of Chelsea, Man United, and the other teams in the second eight of this round of 16. Right, let's kick off with with the big one, PSG versus Real Madrid. Right, PSG, it feels a bit Delia Smith, this one. Who are you? Who are you? Let's be having you. <laughs> Is that what she said? I think it was something like that, wasn't it? I don't really know who PSG are, and I don't think we ever really know who PSG are, because in Ligue 1, they dominate generally the bulk of their games, and then they have this weird thing where the true judgment of them, of course, with the amount of money that they spend, is going to be in the Champions League. In terms of playing style, who are you? Who are you? Let's be having you. You know, Delia, she had something there. Um, because they're largely dependent on all these stars that they've got. And I think that was shown in the group stages where, of course, they finished second to Man City. They had expected goals against of 1.2 every single game. So it shows that it's quite an unreliable defence. And it's a team that is really reliant on quality players and performances and moments which is okay because you've got quality players who can offer performances and moments in the league they have 63.9 percent possession in the champions league they went down to 54.5 they simply weren't good enough at retaining possession against the likes of man city they had 46 percent possession in both those games so against the sort of high high quality sides and it was actually a really really tough group a super tough group actually in hindsight if you see them at the top there RB Leipzig and uh, Bruges as well in there as well. So it's tough for them. And they seem to struggle because the style of play just isn't truly there. They haven't really been able to kind of get themselves sorted out. In terms of a possible lineup, I mean, they've changed more times than the baby with the runs. Like, it is... All, for all these pieces to fit together, I'm just struggling to see it. But then you look at that front line, Mbappe, Messi, Di Maria, who's likely to, to start, and Jenry is a, very useful for the team, of course, as opposed to Neymar, who is just another player who's not going to track back. It, at the back, it, what's also fascinating is the fact that Ramos might not start. You know, as big of a player as he is, it looks like it's more likely going to be Kimpembe and Marquinhos at the back. And when I'm looking at this team and in terms of them being able to get through this, I think we know that there could be moments, but it's at the back where I think the players are going to be really, really key. Gigi Donnarumma is now the established number one for PSG. It took him a second to, to get past Kaelin Navas, but I mean, he had a great game in particular against Man City. I think it was seven saves in that game. In terms of tournament football, Donnarumma is really, really strong. If these games go to penalty shootouts, which of course they could do, we know Donnarumma's fantastic in those scenarios. And he could be huge because they are going to need him because there's going to be well-drilled teams who've you know, had really clear styles of play, a bit like Real Madrid, I guess. And they're going to be able to cut through them. And you're going to need your final line of defence in Gigi Donnarumma to be superb. You're also going to need Marquinhos, who is funny, isn't it? Because he, he kind of is the Ramos of this PSG team. He has an amazing ability to score goals for the team, important goals as well. He's the captain of the side as well. And he hasn't made an error that's led to an opponent's shot in the Champions League for four years. That's 35-90s. He's a really, really special player for PSG and he's going to have to have one hell of a game against a Real Madrid forward line that is purring. And, and generally, they're scoring a lot of goals and the quality of their finishing as well. So if they get a chance, Real Madrid are likely to take it. Of course, we've got to talk about Mbappe and Messi. What's amazing here is that I think we're at a point where Mbappe is more important. 
Mbappe is more important than Messi for PSG. I mean, time will tell, and that might age terribly. But Mbappe has scored a minimum of, of four Champions League goals in the last six seasons, and he's 23. And I think the most important thing here is that if they aren't going to dominate the ball, and it is going to be down to individuals, then that suits Mbappe far more than it suits Messi. Because, you know, Messi excels when a team's got... 60% plus possession that's you know how he thrives so much that dominance being in the final third whereas that pace and that directness that you can offer from Mbappe we saw that last year in the Champions League could be super super important in this game in terms of true quality in the midfield in terms of holding on to the ball that's where PSG struggle as well because they have their sort of two workers be it Adrissa Gay and I mean, Paredes is good on the ball, but Danilo can often play there as well. And then Verratti on that left-hand side, that midfield three, is that element of quality to help you kind of hold on to the ball. But otherwise, it's not a team that dominates possession in these Champions League games. And it's going to be about just getting it to Messi and Mbappe and then hoping something happens, which feels like a really precarious way to play football. And it just shows that it's, it's about getting the right players in the right places. I mean, I might get this totally wrong, but I just feel like this is so distressing jointed in terms of the setup of them and it hasn't truly clicked despite a ridiculous embarrassment of riches where you've got people like Nuno Mendes in the side Hakimi in the side as well but just no true understanding of what they're going to do. PSG come up against a Real Madrid side that is just it's kind of the polar opposite maybe not polar opposite but it's, it's much calmer in how it sets up and, and very much in the image of Carlo Ancelotti in terms of how they got on in the Champions League up until this point of course doing very very well in the league as well but in Group D were pretty good, apart from one, you know, pretty hefty hiccup, if that's a thing, against the Moldovan side, Sheriff Tiraspol, where they lost 2 1. They were really, really solid. You know, in terms of goals that they conceded, they only conceded three goals. Two of those goals came in that defeat to the Moldovans. So you've got a team there where Carlo Ancelotti's gone in there again and just done and done what he does, you know. Allowing the players to thrive, and in particular, the front three, is an interesting talking point because you've got two players that are absolutely nailed down in terms of their playing style. But generally, it's a team that keeps calm and just keeps walking forward. I think it's been in a situation where there's a lot of clubs around it, be it in, the, um, in La Liga or in the Champions League, where they haven't really known what they've been doing. They've been kind of finding their feet into Milan and being one of those. We'll talk about those guys in just a second. But Real Madrid have just been sort of steady. Now, with that, I kind of I'm not totally certain of just how good they are when it comes to those powerhouses as we get further down the line. Last year, they sort of fell away a bit. They seemed jaded in their midfield. But this year, I think Carlo Ancelotti has that, almost that kind of stand back approach that he offers a lot of the time does seem to work. He doesn't have that very clear style where he goes, this is how I play at every club I manage. He goes, OK, what have we got here? What players have we got and, and how should they line up? So I think in terms of how they line up, it's pretty easy to guess how it's going to go. You can have a look at 90% of it and kind of understand how they're going to set up. I think it's the right wing position is going to be interesting. You've got Asensio, who's played there and played pretty well at times. Rodrigo, who can be a bit raw at times. Um who could come in there as well. But then those two players in Benzema and Vinicius are going to be really, really important. I think when we look at the lack of control that PSG might be able to enforce on the game, Real Madrid, that's what it's going to be down for them. You know, the likes of Modric and Cruz have been fantastic this season. And again, Benzema, by far and away, the best forward in the squad. When it comes to his XG this season, it's been outrageous. I mean, he should have scored 9.8 non-penalty XG, or non-penalty goals. He's scored 15. And then 11 and 17 in total because he's only scored two penalties for Real Madrid this season. That's outrageous quality. And his ability as someone who started at Lyon as a left winger to, yes, be a target man for the team. And you can see it in his heat map here, but also kind of be comfortable on that left hand side and, and offer that outlet for Vinicius Jr. to start on that left and then make those diagonal runs in. Those two as a pair have looked really, really strong this season and they will be a huge part of how they move forward in this competition. Vinicius Jr., as I said, is very similar in that regard when it comes to the XG. He's, his XG is 8.4. He's actually scored 12, which is four more, which again shows the quality of the finishing ability of these players in this side this year and just generally Real Madrid as a whole. Six matches played in the Champions League, two goals, three assists, 3.3 key passes per 90 and 2.8 successful dribbles. That's with a completion rate of 57%, which is all pretty solid. He had that raw talent, 
but he didn't have the end product. Now he's looking pretty unstoppable. And let's get to the prediction then when it comes to this. I think you probably can guess where I'm going with this. I feel like this is... Is it a line in the sand? I'm not sure. I feel like there's an implosion on the way and such a fallout when PSG lose this game. I just feel like everything points towards that. The magic and stardust of the likes of Messi, Neymar if he comes back, and Mbappe, of course, are there for all to see. But in modern football, I think you have to have a bit more structure and a bit more consistency in your pattern of play. And that's what Real Madrid have at this moment in time. And I expect Real Madrid to just have a little bit too much quality against an unorganised, in terms of its style, PSG. PSG have so much quality and of course could go and win it. But for me, I'm going to go for Real Madrid to go through in this one. Wow. <laughs> no, no, not again. I'm not doing that again. <sighs> it is freezing out there. Have you noticed? Two options you've got then. One... Get yourself abroad. Get yourself abroad. Enjoy the heat that way. Otherwise, stay indoors. Very, very simple. Either way, you're going to need to get yourself a Surfshark VPN to make sure you don't miss out on any of the content that you love to watch. Fortunately, Surfshark is the sponsor of today's video. If you don't know what Surfshark is, it's a virtual private network that keeps your identity safe by encrypting all the data that goes between the internet and your computer. Keeping your personal data safe from those big companies and those cyber criminals. As I said, you've got two options. Either get yourself abroad and enjoy the sunshine or stay indoors. Very important. Either way, you're going to want to watch the football if you're abroad. And as I did recently in a Surfshark integration, I highlighted that you can watch Match of the Day or any of the highlights that you want by changing your location using the Surfshark VPN when you are abroad to watch the best bits of the football and the sport from the UK. Or... You can change your location to wherever you want if you're in this country to watch some of the best Netflix, Amazon Prime, whatever you want series. I am doing exactly that. I read an article the other day and it was talking about the 30 best dramas out there that are basically from other countries. So with a Surfshark VPN, I can do exactly that. Change my location to wherever I want to be, Sweden, Norway, France, Korea, and watch the best content that's out there whilst it's freezing cold. So when you're globe trotting around the world virtually, of course, the great thing about Surfshark is its clean web feature. This feature blocks ads, trackers, malware, and phishing attempts that allows you to surf the web safely without those irritating ads. So more content options and more privacy and a cracking deal as well. Use my code ALLCOT. Link is in the description right now and you can get yourself 83% off and three months for free. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you could sign up. If you don't like it for some reason, then, of course, you can get your money back. And the thing I love the most about this when it comes to Surfshark is the fact that I can use my Surfshark VPN on unlimited devices. So as I say, link is in the description. Amazing deal. 83% off, three months for free. Go and check them out. Inter Milan versus Liverpool and the big question I have here guys is what is the ceiling of this Inter Milan side? We're about to find out against a Liverpool team that has a newfound depth and an incredible consistency in how they play and I think are one of the front runners for this tournament. If you think of Lukaku leaving, Conte leaving, Inzaghi coming in, Dzeko coming in, I think you thought you were having a downgrade there. That hasn't totally been the case. Inzaghi has offered more options in terms of how Inter Milan score goals. Their XG for Serie A has been very, very impressive. The best in terms of scoring goals, 47.5. And they've actually scored much more than that, well into the 50s. And in Dzeko, they've got a really intelligent player somebody who can find solutions for the team and around him, a lot of creativity. The likes of Lotaro Martinez, who is struggling a little bit with form. Kalanoglu's had a great season for Inter Milan. Barella can score goals as well. And then, of course, kind of suited to the likes of Dumfries if he's going to offer up that, that pace on the, on the right-hand side or Darmian, of course, as well. And then Perisic with that crossing ability as well. So Inter Milan are kind of geared up for Dzeko but in a very different style. We saw it in a game against AC Milan very recently where they put a player on Brozovic to try and stop him. He's so important for them, Inter Milan. In terms of the Champions League, 94 touches per 90. The closest next to him, Vidal, was 75. And uh, he's just a huge metronome for Inter Milan. 
And AC Milan looked to stop him, put Kessie on him to man mark him. And so they were needing to find a different option and route to goal. Dzeko, quite interestingly, kind of went and stay, went away from that target man position and went over to the left-hand side and almost played as a bit of a false nine to create space for others. Yes, Inter Milan lost that game, but they should have won it, really. It was only the last sort of 15, 20 minutes where AC Milan took control. So that's an example of how Dzeko can find solutions for the team. Another huge question in this tie specifically is is the ability to deal with the press because with Jekko he's not going to be running the channels all day long so you're going to have to have that moment of, of clarity and understanding in your patterns of play to get past that impressive press of Liverpool and maybe it'll be down the sides with the likes of Perisic, Darmian or Dumfries on that right hand side that they can get that bit of joy get those crosses in and utilize Martinez and Jekko. That said I struggle to see how Inter Milan make their way through on this one. Just because I think Liverpool look really, really solid in how they're playing and, and the roles of each of their players are both well-defined and quite individual at times. I think Thiago's coming into his own and will do so even more so on the European stage as opposed to the Premier League games where he's been superb in the amount of uh, effort he puts in, the duels he undertakes, but also his passing and vision and progressive passing in particular. F Fabinho crucial in these Champions League games as well as offering that base for the likes of Van Dijk and Salah. Van Dijk in these big European games is now really starting to get back to his best, I feel. And I think these kind of games, you see the leadership and tenacity of him and he'll be up for that challenge up against Dzeko and will probably be quite comfortable with it. I mean, famous last words. Those are dangerous things when it comes to Dzeko. And then, of course, the quality of Mane, Diaz off the bench, Harvey Elliott off the bench, Trent, Robertson, Salah. They're so well drilled. Jota as well. I think Jota steps up in big games and, and finds, you know, he's becoming a real predator for Liverpool. So I just think they've got so much going for them. And I'm going to give my prediction at the end, but you've got to say that Liverpool, Man City, Bayern Munich, all teams that we're going to be talking about in this video, those are the three front runners when it comes to the Champions League. I'll give my prediction at the end of the video, but as you will expect, I feel like Liverpool will have too much for Inter Milan in this game. I think it'll be tight, but I think they'll just have a little bit too much. And I think by the end of this, we'll be looking at Liverpool and thinking, wow, this side can go all the way. Sporting versus Man City, a real underdog story here if Sporting are going to create a massive, massive shock. In terms of then getting out of their group, I think it tells quite a story when you have a look at some of the XG stats. It shows how they like to play and how they can kind of mix it up and be quite malleable. So check this out. You can see Group C, Ajax, of course, ran away with it. Absolutely frightening. And Sporting and Dortmund sort of battled it out for the, the final positions here. But when you see the expected goals for and against 10 and 10.3, that leaves them with a minus expected goal difference of 0 0.3. That tells a bit of a story when you break down the different games. And it's it's quite interesting to, to see that versus uh, Besiktas, Sporting only had 36% possession. Now, this is a team that generally when they're playing in their, in their league, they dominate the ball and they're trying to break down the opposition. And I think in the opening games of the group, they were trying to do that and struggling with it a little bit. In that match against Besiktas, an away game, Sporting only had 36% possession, yet they had 20 shots in the game, created eight <laughs> big chances. So they only had 280 passes the whole game, which meant they were averaging a shot every 14 passes. So that shows that they can play really directly. And that was something different that we hadn't really seen from Sporting, who were trying to generally, you know, dominate possession like they do as they dominate their league form. So you think, oh, OK, is that the route for them now? Then in the next game against Besiktas, same team, 59% possession, scored four, created five big chances. The main point here is that they, they're displaying different ways of, of winning games and showing that they've got multifaceted footballers who are kind of malleable because in their second game against Dortmund, again, a similar thing happened. They went back to the previous method of not having the ball. 35% possession, yet they created four big chances in that game. So what that says to me is that it's an interesting time for sporting in this game in terms of what tactic do they go for do they look to try and hold on to the ball it's a great route to not conceding goals because if you can keep the ball it gives yourself a chance or with a team as dominant as man city do they try something different or try what worked for them in the games against besiktas and dortmund where they don't have possession and then look to play with real counter-attacking verve 
I think that's probably going to be the route just because Man City dominate possession. You literally don't have a choice in that a lot of the time. So they'll have to be careful with that. They're likely to play with a back three midfield in Palina is uh, just a lovely six for them. Porro, who of course is a Man City player who's on loan at Sporting. That will be interesting. I'm pretty sure he can play in this game if I'm wrong. I apologise. And uh, Mateus Nunez as well in the midfield are going to be important in terms of dealing with the press and then be able to play those balls directly and correctly to those attacking players. You've got great attacking midfielders, of course. Goncalves has been fantastic. Paulinho up top and Sarabia as well. Goncalves in particular has really impressed and surprised the people a lot. Um, what's on the books at Wolves this year? He's been uh, involved in 11 direct goal involvements uh, from 17 matches. Also has four goals in four matches in the Champions League. When it comes to Man City, look, embarrassment of riches, of course. This is still the one that they're desperate to get their hands on. And they were fantastic when it came to the, the, the group. One, a group, a very difficult group with PSG in there. And it, I think that PSG game, the first game and the second game, are the two ways that it will work out for Man City. Man City will dominate every game that they play. Fact. But will there be those moments when we're, we're talking about the best players in the world of football where they get undone and they can't break down the opposition? That's the beauty of football for a lot of people, that anyone can win, even if you don't deserve it, you get what you get. But I do think Man City, uh, they have such a tenacity for this competition. They're fed up of of not winning it, basically. And they should have won it by now. And they're starting to run out of, uh, run out of time for a few of the, these guys. The likes of Gundogan, the likes of De Bruyne. The big thing for them will be how they set up. Riyad Mahrez, I think, is an incredible part of this. He played in every single game for Man City in the Champions League, something that we don't often see when it comes to the Champions League. And what was interesting with him was that he wasn't always the primary creator, despite playing out wide. He's actually going to be the person that's probably going to be a key man in terms of scoring the goals. Rio Mahrez was so influential last season in the Champions League, and I expect him to do the same again. If you look at the average positions for Man City in these Champions League games, there's that focus down that left-hand side, and then they want that quality of Riyad Mahrez on the other side. He was averaging four shots per game in the Champions League group stages. Top scorer for them as well with five goals. Two of those, of course, penalties. But I think he's not... He's going to be involved in that creation, of course, because of the dominance of the ball that Man City have. But I don't think he'll be seen as a, the primary creator. That will be down that left-hand side. It'll be interesting to see who they start. You know, you've got the likes of Gundogan, who normally comes into these games. That left-wing position is, is kind of up for grabs with the likes of Grealish, Foden, Sterling, all possibly wanting to play on that left-hand side. And keep an eye out for De Bruyne playing as that false nine for this side but I think they might go for it that little bit more against the sporting side that I think will relinquish possession in this game and Jao Cancelo will be the man who has the ball he was averaging 100.8 touches per 90 in the group stages which is outrageous 35.8 touches in the final third as well he's so important to City right now and he will continue to be crucial for them. Again, this is an exciting stuff when it comes to the predictions, because I just think in terms of the group that Sporting were able to come out of, yes, they did well to get out of it. Of course, you've got Dortmund and Ajax are two tough teams, um, but I still think that they're not going to have enough against Man City, and it would be probably the biggest shock of the round if they were able to get through just because of how good Man City are right now. That said... Look, anything can happen and there is quality in this sporting side. But again, I'm going to have to go with the favourites here and I expect Man City to make their way through quite comfortably. RB Salzburg versus Bayern Munich then. This is an interesting one. Uh, RB Salzburg, the first Austrian side to make it into the knockout. So huge congratulations for them for that. What's interesting here is this is kind of like two ends of the food chain. Now, RB Salzburg, of course, are kind of... A, a cog in a machine that leads to RB Leipzig, let's be honest. And with that, that means that they're never really going to be a powerhouse and probably contributes to the fact that this was the season that they made their way through. One, they've got exciting players and incredibly young players. The average age is 23. But the group was, it was useful. To have Lille, Sevilla and Wolfsburg in their group gave them that opportunity. And look, to be fair to them, they took it. Another one, a bit like Sporting, where it's interesting because they, they have such dominance of the their league. 
66% possession in their games, but they have to kind of twist it up a little bit and be different when they come into the Champions League because they haven't got that same element of dominance. And so in the Champions League, they actually, in the win over Sevilla, which got them through and secured that knockout spot, they had an average possession of 34%. So the playing style is different. It's different to how they play in the league and it will be very direct. They were looking to get the ball through to Adeyemi as quickly as possible. And when it comes to those important players, there's a few people who could make a name for themselves. Uh, Saivald and Kamara in midfield. And as I've spoken about on this channel, and you can check out the video, there'll be uh, a link uh, there for you. Adeyemi is one hell of an exciting player. And for a team that's going to play counter-attacking against a Bayern Munich side that is inevitably going to dominate the ball... Adiyemi could offer something here. It could be really exciting for, for the German international to, to hurt Bayern Munich. And for all of those players, they'll be gunning to, you know, to get that multi-million pound move because that's what RB Salzburg do. And so if they can cause a stir, I mean, it would be outrageous against Bayern Munich. But with the way that they play, there's a lot of focus on the, the wide fullback, sorry, Ulmer and Christensen to get forward for the team. And then otherwise they're going to make their way through the middle of the pitch with Siovald Kamara as that DM, Aronson as that attacking midfielder. And as I said, Adeyemi and Okafor up top. Problem is they're coming up against possibly the favourites in Bayern Munich. I think a, you can put a forward of a very, very good case for Bayern Munich uh, just through the dominance that they showed in the group stage and the dominance that they're showing under Julian Nagelsmann. They've really sort of adapted to his vision as the coach of the team and they're just so scary going forward and so tight at the back. They've got a really interesting new kind of formation. It'll be interesting to see what happens with Alfonso Davies, who's out with a heart condition due to COVID at the moment. He says he's bored and he wants to come back, but of course they don't want to rush him through. And with this game, they should had have enough. That formation that they will offer is fascinating. Three at the back, then you've got Tolisso and Kimmich in midfield, and then front four, and then one up top in Lewandowski, of course, who is outrageous as well the poll's got 24 goals in the Bundesliga as present he's averaging a goal every 86 minutes the same can be said in the Champions League group stages nine goals so far <laughs> ridiculous with a scoring frequency of a goal every 86 minutes in both which is really weird isn't it that is a weird stat hit the like button because that stat's weird and I think it deserves a like. And interesting, he's only had 185 touches in the Champions League over the six matches. So he's scoring every 20 touches. And also, if you have a look at his heat map, you can also see that he is just staying in the box because they're so dominant. And that kind of comes from this formation, which is interesting. Upper Meccano or Sula as the centre-back will be really important in terms of dealing with Adeyemi. But I think there's an understanding here that because they are so dominant high up the pitch, this is a formation essentially with the ball and ultimately Bayern Munich generally have the ball all the time. Leroy Sane has been fantastic for them. He's finally kind of fulfilling that destiny as the German poster boy. He's been playing on the wing and on that left-hand side during the group stage, he did really, really well. Nine goal involvements, five goals, four assists in the Champions League so far. In this new formation, he's kind of playing more of a like a hybrid attacking midfielder, sort of second striker, but his ability to do both is something that's that's really, really impressed me so far this season. And I think the most impressive thing when it comes to Bayern Munich and when we get to the idea of who's favourites for this tournament, again, I, I kind of come back to the expected goals because I think it's important to, to highlight in the group stage, and I can run through the results, 3-0, 5-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 4-0, 5-2, 2-1, 3-0, 
I think you've got Bayern Munich, Man City and Liverpool as the, the key three when it comes to being favourites for this. I'd love to know what you think, guys. Who are your favourites? I've got a funny feeling about Liverpool. I just think they've got all the tools that they need. And I think with the Premier League race possibly over the next few weeks kind of running away from them, it might not do, of course. But if it were to, I think there's a freshness and a focus on the Champions League. I think they're excited about that. And I see something happening here. I do. I know it's a really tough one to say when it comes to Inter Milan in terms of that run through. And if you're putting money on it, put your money on Bayern Munich and Man City. But I just wonder... It's a gut call, and I think when it's at this stage of the tournament, you've got to go with gut calls. But I'm going to go with Liverpool to win the whole thing. Let me know who you think will win the Champions League in the comments down below. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so you don't miss the live as soon as we go live to react to these games that we're talking about. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe to the channel, as I said. I want to get to 200k as soon as possible, and I need your help. So make sure you hit that button. I'll see you on the lives.